Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Clark and I'm a publisher of local history books. My books are full of people's stories and some of the favourite stories I've collected over the years involve food and I'm going to share some of them with you today. I'll start with the memories of the Second World War and the rationing of food at that time. Here's a ration book from a family in Newcastle. But note the date on it, 1953-54. These were the final years of rationing, but it's actually nine years after the war ended in 1945. Tea, sugar, butter and meat all went on the ration in 1940. Eggs and cheese followed the next year. In 1942, sweets began to be rationed as well. Here's a photograph of the weekly rations during the Second World War. The rations varied during the war, but in one year in the 1940s, these were some of the weekly amounts. Bacon and ham, four ounces, sugar, eight ounces, tea, two ounces, butter, two ounces, cheese, one ounce, margarine, four ounces. It was said that it was a little bit of everything and was a balanced diet. A popular page in the ration book with children was the sweet page. Sweet rationing was hard on youngsters and many looked forward to little treats. Local author Jack Hare remembers one such treat at his school in Stanley a few years after the Second World War. Here's Jack's story. A queue in our school hall meant one of two things. Either you were going to be given something to eat or it was the knit nurse. One day the teacher told us all to bring into school a tin or jar with the lid for the next day. At the end of the day, we were given our tins back, and to our surprise, they were filled to the top with sweetened chocolate powder. We tasted it and were pleased, and spent most of that night licking the chocolate powder off our sticky little fingers. Next day, the teacher informed us there was still powder left, and to bring our tins in again. So what did we do this time? We hunted until we found the biggest tins we could, and once again they filled them. We ate chocolate powder for days until our jaws ached and our fingers were thin and pale with continuously sucking them. As an adult, I now know we must have appeared greedy. But at that time, with no sweets, no money and food shortages, it was like leaving an alcoholic in a brewery. Now the tea page from the ration book. There were lots of little things people did to get them through rationing. One lady told me her family all liked weak tea, so they would swap their spare tea for other items. Lots of things like that went on during the war. Meanwhile, in Germany, where people preferred coffee, they had to make their favourite beverage out of acorns. There were lots of campaigns during the war, and a famous one was Dig for Victory, where people were encouraged to grow their own vegetables. Every effort was made to produce as much as we could, so it meant there was less to import from overseas. At the same time, over 80,000 women worked in the Land Army to help keep Britain fed. Allotments were popular. This is a gated council poster for wartime allotments in the town that cost five shillings a year. Potatoes and tomatoes were grown in Saltwell Park and they were given first to hospitals and institutions in Gateshead. In 1942, a food production drive was held in Gateshead. This is the cover of the programme for the week's events. Campaigns like this were common at the time, and during the week there were lectures, exhibitions, demonstrations and film shows. Here are some of the highlights of the food production drive week. There was a demonstration of wartime cookery and talks on keeping rabbits and pigs. There were lots of recipes given out during the war that helped stretch out the rations. Some of them that I've collected are straight from the garden soup, cabbage soup, potato and kipper pie, herring and tomato casserole, fatless pastry, economical mince, oatmeal supper dish, rabbit mould, stuffed vegetable marrow, vegetable hot pot, eggless Yorkshire pudding, and my favourite, 
chocolate potato cake. This is the recipe for chocolate potato cake. You put the, you put the ingredients together like a normal cake, but to make it go further, you add cold mashed potato. I've made these cakes and although I wouldn't win Bake Off with them, most people think they are okay. If chocolate cake was in short supply, this wouldn't be a bad replacement. Another wartime campaign was Save Bread and Serve Potatoes. This poster has a loaf of bread lost at sea after a ship had been sunk with the slogan, Save Bread and You Save Lives, Serve Potatoes and You Serve the Country. Although bread was not rationed until 1946, it was seen as an important commodity during wartime. There was a shortage of flour in the country, so it had to be imported from abroad. With so many ships being sunk by German U-boats, the humble loaf was seen as a luxury. So there was a big push to serve potatoes. There was a character called Potato Pete, who was used to promote their use. He even had a rhyme. Potatoes new, potatoes old, potatoes in a salad cold, potatoes baked or mashed or fried, potatoes whole, potatoes pied. Enjoy them all, including chips. Remember spuds, don't come in ships. There was another character called Clara Carrot. Here's an illustration of her. And she wanted you to eat more carrots. One of the recipes I often make, which is quite nice, is carrot marmalade. Although I do use a First World War recipe that uses a lot more sugar than you would have had during the Second World War. Here's a window display for the County Durham Grow More Food campaign. There's posters in the window with the slogan, Dig for Victory. And there's also one that says, Don't let Hitler stuff you. Grow your own onions. Here we have a banana and a parsnip. Bananas were in very short supply during the war. And one alternative used a parsnip. The idea was to boil parsnips until all the taste was gone. Then you added banana essence. I suppose if you shut your eyes and pretended, it felt like you were eating a banana. I've spoken to people though who tried it, and while some did enjoy the taste, most people thought it was horrible. The best way to eat it, however, was to mash it all up and add a little sugar. They used to say, if you saw a queue, you joined it. There must be a good reason for so many people queuing. And many people remember queuing up for bananas when they finally returned to the shops after the war. The war came to an end with celebrations for victory in Europe and victory over Japan. This is a photo of the VE party in Exeter Street, Gateshead, in May 1945. At these parties, tables were lined up in the street and food was served to children. But this was not the end of rationing. It would not be until 1952 when tea came off the ration, followed by sugar, eggs and sweets the next year. Cheese, meat and butter were among the final rationed items in 1954 when rationing finally did come to an end. I'll move on to some other food stories. And first, let's go shopping. And where better to go than the co-op? Here we see the staff outside the Wickham branch of Swalwell Co-op on Fellside Road. They have a nice window display and they're advertising tea, coffee and cocoa. And who remembers their co-op number? This is the co-op book for the Jones family from Bencham with the number 37956. You quoted the number each time you shopped and the purchases were recorded. Then later, a percentage of these purchases, the dividend, was paid back to you. Kathleen Harrison, the author of the book, Memories of Gateshead, recalls her memories of shopping at the co-op in the 1950s. The co-op store had a biscuit smell from the broken biscuits, which could be bought at a reduced price. I love the taste of these and the smell of them, alongside the other smells of bacon, cheese and butter. There was also the smell of sawdust. Behind the counter were sacks of sugar or flour sitting on the sawdust covered floor. 
Food products were not pre-packed and were all weighed out as needed. I would watch as the assistant scooped the sugar or flour out of the sacks and tipped it onto a dish on the scales. Once the item was weighed, the assistant then took the dish from the scales and tipped its contents into a paper bag. For a child, it was so fascinating to watch. At one time, a lot of food would be made locally. Nearly every town had factories that produced sweets, jam, pop and other products. One gated firm was Powell's, who were based in Low Fell. Their products include preserves, lemon cheese, table jellies, pickles, sauces and vinegar. Their 1929 brochure described the Powell factory as equipped in the most hygienic fashion and set amid the clean, bracing surroundings of the country. Low Fell was described as one of the most delightful suburbs in the northeast coast area and products were produced in the pure, clean upland atmosphere and surrounded by green fields and pleasant woodlands. Pimlico Court now stands on the site of the factory today. Another food factory based in Gateshead was Hoggett's on Askew Road. This advert from the late 1950s describes their products, including beetroot, pickled onions, red cabbage, piccalilli, tomato ketchup, and potato crisps at three, three pence a packet. Today, many people have their food delivered, but that's nothing new, it was being done for years. The co-op would deliver as well as butchers, bakers, fishmongers, and of course, many of us would have a milk delivery. In the early years, that was from a milk churn by horse and cart. This photograph shows the staff of the farmers in Cleveland Dairy with their horse, and they're outside their shop at 60 High Street, Felling. Later, milk came in bottles, and here are two old bottles I have. On the pint bottle, it says, please rinse and return, and it also has the following rhyme. On each new day, your milkman collects bottles by the score, but what will please him most of all, your empties by the door. And who remembers having milk at school? Here's a class from Newcastle enjoying their milk in the early 1970s. Also at school, many of us stayed for our dinners. This photograph from 1949 shows girls at Gateshead Grammar School about to be served their food. You can see the dinner ladies on the right. Local author and historian Anthea Lang in her book, Gateshead Remembered, said the town was a pioneer in the world of school dinners and cheap school dinners in particular. Anthea says, when the rector, William Moore Ead, discovered that many children were simply falling asleep at their lessons due to malnourishment, he realised something needed to be done. He decided to copy a scheme he had seen in Sweden, which produced mass meals for school children. Going one step further, he even invented a special oven in which to cook the meals. This penny dinner scheme operated for many years in Gateshead from 1884. For one penny a day, children could have soup, peace pudding, and either rhubarb or raisin pudding. Something youngsters would do during the October half-term holiday was to go tatey picking. This is a great photo of potato picking at Barlow Fell near High Spen in 1964. Note the woman standing up. To me, it looks like she's stretching. It was certainly back-breaking work. There's a sack of new potatoes in the doorway of Smith's Greengrocers on Felling High Street in the 1920s. Look at the wonderful display of fruit and veg in the window. Many people have always grown their own vegetables. This photo of men, well-dressed men, and a couple of boys and a dog was taken at allotments at Felling in 1909. Note the pit heap in the background. Moving from veg to meat, this is Thompson's Butcher Shop in Crowhall Lane Felling in the 1920s. Some of the meat on offer would include trotters, tripe, rabbit, liver, kidney, black pudding, sheep's heart, 
and even sheep's head. One lady told me that during the war, her mother was given a sheep's head, which she'd never cooked before. She was horrified by the state of its teeth, so got an old toothbrush out and cleaned the teeth before cooking it. Today, uh, today our high streets have many takeout restaurants, pizzas, kebabs, burgers, etc. But for many, fish and chips is their favourite. Evan Martin, a great writer in, and historian from Bedlington, once told me this story of going to his local fish and chip shop during the Second World War. When I was, when I was younger, a treat would be fish and chips from Coxon's chip shop. We usually had a long wait, as it seemed Mr. Coxon cooked one order at a time. Mrs. Coxon kept us kids entertained by giving us words to spell, the winner getting a couple of chips. During the war, paper was sometimes difficult to obtain. Fish and chips were put straight onto the newsprint of the paper. No such finery as greaseproof paper in those days. At one time, Mrs. Coxon was short of newspaper and said she would give a free bag of chips to anyone bringing in 10 sheets of paper into her shop. One of my friends had the bright idea of going round all the outside toilets and pinching the newspaper that was hanging by the netties. Luckily, Mrs. Coxon soon caught on and we were chased out of her shop. This is my final image and a much loved one, the B-roll recipe book. This book is from around 1930. Home baking made a comeback during the recent lockdown and we turned to our B-roll books to make cakes, rock buns, fruit scones and my favourite, cheese scones. I've come to the end of my talk, which I just see as a starting point, just a taster of some of the wonderful foods we all remember. And I hope I've brought back some memories with my food stories, recipes and tales of rationing. Thanks for listening and goodbye.